So my name is Jason. Uh, I'm a programmer at Datadog in New York City, and I'm here to talk about optimizing Go programs. Uh, I have like a lot of slides, a lot of get to get through, so it's going to be kind of quick. Hopefully, everyone can follow along. Um, I wanted to start with a quote. Uh, I'll up the ante a bit on the old computing uh, kind of anecdotes. Uh, so we could actually start in 1968 when Dijkstra wrote a letter to ACM. Uh, and then uh, Nicholas Wirth decided to title it, Go To Considered Harmful. Uh, it was a letter that basically kind of bemoaned the widespread use of GoTo in programming languages at the time. Uh, six years later, in 1974, Donald Knuth wrote this in uh, something called Structured Programming with GoTo Statements. He wrote, uh, there is no doubt that the grail of efficiency leads to abuse. Programmers waste enormous amounts of time thinking about or worrying about the speed of non-critical parts of their programs. And these attempts at efficiency actually have a strong negative impact when debugging and maintenance are considered. We should forget about small efficiencies, say, about 97% of the time. Yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. Uh, the emphasis, if you can actually tell, uh, is mine. This is one of the most kind of famous quotes about optimization. Um, probably everyone here would recognize it had I not removed the famous bit uh, in the ellipsis, which is uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, unfortunately, people don't really understand the context of that quote. They don't understand that it was in a paper that was actually about optimizing programs. Uh, so people have different kind of definitions of what premature is. Uh, we kind of want to put all that philosophy to one side and start off with the idea that we've written a program and we've run it and either it uses too much CPU or it's too slow and it doesn't have the, the throughput that we need. So kind of why am I here talking about this? Uh, I work at Datadog uh, and at Datadog we have uh, the kind of cute mascot over here on the left and then we get a lot of metrics from our customers and we present them with some pretty charge for them. Uh, Anyone here who knows kind of like what time series data is all about uh, knows that there's, yeah, there's like lots of roll-ups, lots of uh, uh, like aggregations, time aggregations, space aggregations, all this stuff. It's really, really uh, high CPU intensive. And it's actually, there's a high IO intensive part as well, but most of that is kind of going into memory, so it's fine. But there's a ton of CPU bound work, and uh, we found that you can really squeeze a lot out of the stone once you've written kind of like a semantically correct uh, sort of daemon to do some of this work. Uh, so we've got like 20 to 30 speed ups on the kind of naive implementation. So if there's one thing that you remember from this talk, it would be this slide, and especially its title, measure everything. Like you want to measure everything, you want to kind of use science and not guessing and not uh, like, I don't know, like magic. Like you want to know exactly what your code is doing. You want to actually learn why it's doing it. Uh, reading the code, uh, outputting assembly. It's actually, even if you don't know assembly, output assembly, take a look at it. Uh, a lot of times you can kind of uh, sort of reverse engineer what the compiler is actually doing for you. The Go standard library code, even the runtime package, isn't scary. And as of 1.4, it's written Go. So just like look at it and see how it is. And we'll be doing some of that in this talk. So the first part, uh, I want to talk about identifying the 3% that Knuth was talking about. Uh, how, when we write a program, how do we figure out where we'll get the most benefit? Uh, there's, this is actually called Amdel's Law, uh, but it's not really important. You just want to know where your program is spending time and then attack that section of the program. So the first way we can do it is with a profiler. Uh, Go has a nice built-in sampling profiler. It's really low overhead. I think it runs once every 100 milliseconds or so. Uh, Here's how you just import runtime pprof, and then you start a CPU, pref CPU profile on a io.writer. So it doesn't have, actually have to be a file. It can be anything. Uh, so we'll output a, a pprof file, which you can do some stuff with, uh, which I'll go over in a second. There's another way to do this, though. You can use the net HTTP pprof package. Uh, here it's being imported for its side effects. Its side effects are it registers some global HTTP handlers. Uh, and then if you listen and serve using the global HTTP handler, which you can do by passing a nil handler, then it will kind of respond to these different HTTP endpoints. And you can run the Go tool 
uh, pprof directly against those endpoints, and it will kind of know, uh, it will drop you into the pprof shell. So you can use this for the CPU profile, for a heap profile, for high memory use, uh, for a blocking profile to see where your goroutines are, are being blocked. Uh, I'm only going to be talking about CPU stuff today, so, but all this other stuff is there, and you can kind of really go wild and explore it. So here we have a uh, pprof shell. So we've, we've run this. Either uh, we've saved it to a file, or we've run the uh, go tool pprof against an HTTP endpoint. And um, you see, we can kind of take the top samples to see this was a program that essentially just read from a queue. And uh, the queue had a bunch of Z, uh, Zlib compressed messages, and it decompressed them and wrote them to, to disk. So you can see it's using a lot of syscalls. It's using a lot of CGO calls because we're using a CGO uh, decompression library, which is actually in-house. You can take the cumulative as well. So this is, this is top 20, it says, but I've chopped it to fit on the slide. Uh, and you can see that our kind of CZlib uh, is using 65%, which is you know, to be expected because that's really all it's doing. Uh, you can also do uh, something really cool, which is you can look at line by line kind of where the profiler was taking its samples with list, so you took list and then a function name. Uh, you, need the, you need the actual source code available in the place where it was compiled, so it's kind of not great to do this on a production system because you probably don't have the code there. But uh, yeah, so here's like the hash, hash lib uh, CRC32 update function. It's really simple, it starts with an XOR and then it loops over all the bytes and as we would expect, uh, all the time is being spent in that loop. Uh, you can even disassemble it and then it will, the, the tool will tell you uh, line by line in the assembly instructions where uh, time is being spent. Uh, I thought it was kind of neat that the XOR just kind of compiles to an XOR, which is nice. Uh, and then the, uh, the expensive part, which is actually tabulating the, the CRC, uh, it spends a lot of time in this move. If I was smarter, I would be able to kind of figure out why. But if, if this is like really important code to you, you can actually kind of drill down to this level. And finally, my favorite thing to do with pprof is to make these pretty pictures. So this is kind of call graph, and uh, the big boxes correspond to the places where you're spending a lot of time. This is a call graph for a different program. I'll actually go into this with a little bit more detail uh, in the next section. So another way we can figure out kind of where we need to change code is by instrumentation using XPVAR. So XPVAR is a standard uh, library package. Uh, stands for export variables, probably. And um, it does the same thing with registering things on the nil handler, on the default uh, HTTP handler. And what you can do is you can kind of create these variables. Uh, you can set them to different values, uh, values that are like, that have some kind of meaning in your program. And then uh, you can hit an HTTP interface, debug vars, and you can get those values out. And you can feed those values to whatever kind of downstream uh, charting uh, system or, or any kind of intake that, that, could, that could use them. Um, it's, it's really good because you can really kind of take some more high-level me measurements with this than with Profiler. So you can kind of see m more at the, like, at the level of what your program is actually doing. You can take measurements that, that have some meaning there. You can take like, channel length throughputs. Uh, you can like, look at latency numbers uh, for particular sections that you want. Uh, and when you import it, you also get some free stats. Uh, the GC stats, the garbage collector stats, are probably the star of the show, but if you're interested in like, how your program is allocating and stuff, there's, there's tons of stats in there. Uh, so it's, it'll probably be shocking when you first run, uh, when you first go to get your var from HTTP, it's going to be like this huge thing with tons of JSON, and uh, you're not going to be able to find the variable that you care about. But all this stuff is really useful. I wanted to tell kind of like a little story to sort of give this all some context. Um, so at work, we have a daemon called Muzon. The name is not really significant. But um, essentially what it does is it reads from a queue, and then it parses the messages that it reads in one, actually, set of Go routines. And then it kind of resolves those messages against a bunch of other uh, data sources. So these messages have like keys and stuff, and then it needs to go to like Postgres or, or, or Redis or something like that to look that stuff up. And the resolver kind of takes a lot of time. So it, it's like batched, and it also has this like local cache of all this stuff that it does. And then after the messages are resolved, it can actually go and do its real work. 
Um, so these are uh, charts for kind of variable output for things that I cared about for the, uh, you know, how, how well um, the zone is running. Uh, so this is the kind of lag behind the, 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 the downstream queue that it was reading its messages from. And you can see that it's kind of like spiking really high all the time. And this is bad because uh, this like essentially represents latency for our customers. Like they're sending us data and then the data is going to, whatever Muzone is doing with the data, it's going to get backed up in this queue while it's doing whatever it is that it's doing. And uh, of course, when I first saw this, I had no idea what it was doing. So uh, then I checked the length of those two uh, parsed and resolved channels that we saw before, and I saw that um, the parser was fine, but every once in a while we were getting caught up and the parser channel was filling up because the resolver wasn't actually resolving fast enough. And finally, the resolver has an internal cache of metrics, and it was kind of like this, this dumb way where it was going through and it was flushing everything to... Uh, was flushing everything, replacing it with a new cache, and then using the old cache to kind of fill it back in and then getting rid of it. And so you can see uh, at the bottom that kind of the number of metrics like it takes a big dive about every half an hour, and it corresponds exactly with all this stuff. So even if you have this, it's still kind of like, okay, I think I know what's going on, but you don't really know. So that's when you break out the profiler. This is a real like 30 second profile uh, in production. And you can see that I, I did this when the spike was actually happening. And you can see that hash insert uh, map access to fast string, AES hash body, these are all parts of the map implementation. They're all really big boxes, so it's obvious that something is kind of going wrong and we're spending a lot of time in maps, and that's never where we want to be. So the cache implementation was changed to basically not behave that way, but to be a little bit more kind of straightforward and just save a timestamp and go through and just delete things that are too old. And everything got better. And you can see that the light blue line down on the bottom corresponds to the, all the spikes uh, that we were having before. So this is kind of like the ideal situation. You want to have like all your data up front. You want to have some kind of hypothesis about what's going on. You want to measure and see, okay, like this looks like it's actually what's going on. And you want to change, and then you want to get verification that what you've changed actually does something. So uh, we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit. Uh, once you've identified what is too slow, you, you need to actually go and write faster code. So <laughs> uh, to do this, you, we can use some benchmarks. So if it's kind of like, if it's just really small isolated things, uh, we can just make some really small kind of repeatable uh, benchmark tests. Uh, here is some kind of benchmark output for a bunch of different uh, zlib functions. Um, so the you can see here, this was a, compressing and decompressing a 942k file and uh, the fastest one essentially just said uh, put it all into czlib and then took it all back out in one allocation and for even smaller ones it was actually much faster but for bigger things uh, it didn't really matter but you can write these kind of benchmarks for anything and you can use dash benchmem to get the number of allocations per kind of per loop and that's a lot of times allocations are the killer. Uh, maybe you're doing allocations you didn't think you were doing, uh, and that's gonna like kill your actual performance. So we can use some benchmarks to actually like look at the Go implementation. So we're gonna write a couple like toy benchmarks of like, oh, this versus this, what's faster? And then kind of see what we can do to explore maybe why it's faster. And you, you, you don't wanna do the benchmark and then stop. You wanna do a benchmark and then learn about why it is. If you just stop and it's a mystery, then you haven't learned anything and you can't actually apply the results of that benchmark properly. So structs versus maps. This is kind of a big bugbear of mine. Uh, Go has structs and a lot of people use maps instead because they're coming from uh, dynamic languages where everything is a map or they have like from JavaScript and Python where even objects are essentially maps. And so they decide, I don't know exactly what this, what this thing is going to look like. I need some kind of heterogeneous data storage, so I'm just going to use a map. So we can see here that a map from int to int versus a struct of basically some ints, uh, we just loop over them, add the two ints together, and the struct is like 25 times faster than the map access. So that's good, but again, like we want to actually know why. 
So what we can do is we can write a small program, and then we can use the Go tool 6G, which is the uh, AMD64 uh, Go compiler, with dash S, and it'll produce the actual assembly output for our code. And we can see here, this is the full assembly output for lines four and five, which is just basically declaring a struct with some, some values. Uh, AA and BB correspond to uh, 170 and, and 187 in the assembly, and then adding them together. And so we can see, like, okay, uh, it looks like, uh, like, even if you don't know the kind of weird plan nine assembly that it's outputting, you can see, okay, like, it, it looks like it's just kind of loading from these two offsets and then uh, adding them together. So that's pretty straightforward. And then we can look at the map one. Uh, this is very, very abbreviated code of just the line that adds the two maps. So just the line that does the two map accesses. And you can see that it's like the first line is like allocating a string, and then it's doing all this stuff, and it calls the function. So you have like this subroutine jump, and it's, it's, it does this all twice to get A and to get B. And you, you can kind of tell this is going to be a lot more expensive operation. Uh, and in fact, Here's the full output for lines four and five for those two uh, functions. So you can see, like, map is like actually crazy uh, expensive and a lot more complex than the struct, uh, even though they they kind of look and feel the same in the code. And you know, we can we can we can use this knowledge in the future, and we can avoid using maps when a struct will do. And just by doing that, you're going to kind of save yourself a lot of optimization work in the future. So a little bit more on maps, because despite the fact that I'm saying you should use structs instead, uh, you can't always do that, because maps are actually incredibly useful. Uh, there's a reason why they're in the language. So maps are hash tables. Uh, that's not actually mentioned in the spec. Uh, the spec calls them something like an unordered something. I don't know. It, it, it says they're hash tables, but it says it in a way that doesn't admit it. Uh, so when you do a lookup, you have to hash the key. You have to uh, traverse all the buckets to, uh, to find, you gotta, you gotta use the hash to find the bucket, then you gotta go through the bucket to find the actual match for the key. Uh, some of these things like hashing the key is you know, on on the key length. Uh, traversing the bucket to find the key is on the length of the hash bucket. And then it returns a, a copy of the value. So uh, writing is like almost the same thing. Uh, you can look in the runtime to kind of find the code that's doing that. It's pretty interesting. So let's look at just one more kind of comparison here. It's between string keys and struct keys in maps. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so I have a variable here named empty, which is the empty struct, which is nice, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so essentially, I think having struct with two curlies is really gross. Um, so we, have a, so we have a string key here with a reasonably long but present unique identifier and then a non-present string. And then we have a struct key with just two ints, like the same as before. And then we run the bench thinking like, oh yeah, the struct key is small and it's going to be great. And, and then like the string key map like beats the pants off the struct key map. So like what, what is going on here? Um, well, we can take our kind of test benchmark and we can actually kind of compile it into a program and then we can run pprof on the program. Um, it's, it's, it's all there, but go test actually gives you the, the binary, and then you can use all the test uh, flags. There's a CPU flag prof profile in there. And the string keys profile is interesting, because it basically there's the benchmark, and then there's this uh, runtime function called map access to fast string, and that's it. So, okay, that's, that's peculiar. So we can look at the other, uh, the struct one, and we see something that we might kind of expect more of, uh, we have map access to, not fast anything, just map access to, and then hash lookup, and then we see mem hash. Okay, we're like actually hashing this struct to look things up, and uh, there's like a mem equal thing, which is like the way that the structs are being compared in the bucket. So, if we actually go to look into the code, uh, it turns out that hashing the string and hashing the struct is like not the issue. Uh, that hashing the struct will be faster than hashing the string. Like the problem is that in hash map, actually, it's not a problem, but in hash map fast.go, which is this go now, which is nice, because it used to be C, uh, there's a bunch of uh, kind of fast paths for, for accessing maps. And uh, there's a fast path for strings. And what that fast path for strings is doing is if the hash table is just a single bucket, it like skips the hash and just like looks through the bucket for the, for the string. So that's why our profile before for strings 
only ever hit that and never hit any hashing functions. So because we're skipping all that hashing stuff, that's why the string maps were, were much faster. And that's like a, just a real part of the map implementation that we can't avoid. So lastly, uh, I'm gonna look at, we're gonna look at kind of heap and stack allocation. Uh, this gets really, really dicey and really hard to understand sometimes because the compiler kind of tricks us, as we will see. But essentially, when you allocate something and it goes on the stack, it's good because the compiler kind of makes space for it beforehand. And when you allocate something and it goes on the heap, uh, it goes through a dynamic allocator, and then it puts pressure on the garbage collector versus on the stack. When you return from the function, the stack frame gets popped, and then, and then everyone's happy, and the memory goes away. Um, so we can kind of try to measure this here. Uh, so there's like the kind of elusive array in Go, which no one ever uses, uh, except maybe some crypto people. Um, so we're trying to allocate kind of 1K on the stack versus 1K on the heap. So we, make a, we return a pointer from one thing, which we think, OK, the pointer will be allocated on the heap so that it can be kind of passed around. And then we return the kind of stack allocated array. Uh, and then we run our benchmark. And then, again, the heap one was faster. So that, that's, that's not really what we expected. Uh, maybe you might think it's maybe because the 8 byte pointer is cheaper than actually like pushing around a 1 kilobyte buffer. Um, but that's not what's happening. What's actually happening is the Go compiler is tricking us. And uh, if, you run, uh, if, you, if you run your code with, with, uh, built with the GC flags dash M, it will actually, like you can build it or you can run it with Go test. And it'll actually show you all the, like, what the optimizer is going to do. And this line down here, on line 21, uh, it's saying this heaped, uh, like, in 64 array literal doesn't escape. So I'm not going to bother, like, heap allocating. And we can turn those allocations off. And then we get kind of, like, the thing that we expected, which is, like, the stack allocation is, like, 30 times faster. And we can actually look at the assembly as well. Uh, and we can see that on the stack allocation one, uh, the args, which has the, I believe it has the arguments and the return value. Uh, it's, uh, it's 1024, 400 in, in hex. And um, this is like the whole kind of implementation. Uh, I guess Plan 9 has some like Duff device meta things there going on. And then uh, the, the heap allocation stack, we can see that we're using runtime.new object. And that's, you know, that's allocating a new, a new object. Uh, that the runtime knows about, the GC knows about, it'll get garbage collected later. Uh, so, kind of in summary, you should measure, you shouldn't guess. Uh, There's a cute saying, cute, cute phrase there from, from Dustin. Uh, intuition equals guessing equals being wrong and thinking you're awesome. Don't be wrong, don't think you're awesome, think you don't know what you're doing, and uh, measure everything so that you will know what you're doing. Uh, when you have a real program that's not a benchmark, None of this stuff is something that you can intuit. Uh, like the cost of, of allocation, whether or not this thing escapes the heap or not. We could have taken that other benchmark that, that we wrote, which has the, the heap and the stacked allocation, and we could have decided, oh, heap allocation is really fast. We can just use it everywhere. And then in the real code, it will actually escape, and then we won't get that, in, uh, that, that optimization that the compiler was doing, and then we would be like hamstringing ourselves with all this unnecessary uh, heap allocation. So, um, well, I have like 30 seconds left. So uh, I have this quiz here. Since I was spending a lot of time in the map code to pr prepare this, uh, does anyone know what this is going to do? So it has a map of float64 to bool, and then it sets uh, nan to true, nan to true again, and then nan to false. No idea. All right, well, you know? One? Yeah, three. Three is correct. Uh, do I have a mouse here? Yeah, three. Because nan doesn't equal nan. And there's actually an optimization in the float, uh, the float map which says if there's a nan, give it a random hash so that you don't have one giant bucket full of nans that you're going through. So 